morning. So glad that you're here today. It is really good to be together this morning with each new day, with each new year. The Lord is still good. We still serve the same God who is loving to us and patient with us and awesome and still enduringly good for the world. And and I'm so glad that you're here today and that we're here together to spend some time thinking about that very God and and listening to his word today. Glad you're here. There's a British actor who played Sherlock Holmes in one of the many TV versions of Sherlock Holmes. There have been a lot of remakes of those stories. Uh, But this particular actor is interesting because this actor who played Sherlock Holmes actually became a real hero in real life several months ago. You may have heard uh, about this, the Uh, The actor was riding in a taxi cab, just riding by, when out of his window he looked and he saw a delivery man on a bicycle who was being mugged by four men who were trying to steal the packages he was holding and his bicycle. And so the actor jumps out of the taxi cab and after some shoving and, and shouting and pulling them off and making a scene, finally these four men run off with nothing in their hands and no one was harmed. And the weirdest thing about it was all of this took place just a few blocks away, really right around the corner from 221 Baker Street, which is the home address of Sherlock Holmes in those old English novels, prompting many to wonder, could this be the real Sherlock Holmes? Isn't that bizarre? It's not often that someone who plays a hero gets to actually play the hero in real life, gets to swoop in and save the day. Certainly not a role that I'm familiar with. Uh, The last time I had the chance to be a hero, my Little League baseball team was sorely disappointed. Kind of like Seahawks fans with their backup kicker last night. (laughs) Not a hero. In fact, I don't think anyone has ever accused me of saving the day. And yet, what if I were to tell you that As Christians, you and me are called to do exactly that. We are called to save the day, not to jump out of taxi cabs in London and and save people from burglars, but to save the literal day, the literal hours and minutes that we have been given in our lives. Because there's something about our days, our hours, our minutes, our very breaths, that need rescuing. That's what Ephesians tells us. We read this passage just moments ago. Ephesians 5 and verse 15. Listen to what it says once more. It says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, But understand what the will of the Lord is. But I don't know about you, but I find that quite striking, almost quite alarming when I read what it says right here. It it tells us to make the most of our opportunities, make the most of our time, because why? Because the days are evil? Kind of sets off alarm bells for me. What does that mean? I've been wrestling all week with what exactly does that mean when it says to us that the days are evil. Is Paul simply saying that there is a lot of evil in our world today? Because that certainly could be true. It is true. There is a a lot of wrong, a lot of bad, a lot of sin in our world today. And I do think that that perhaps is most of what Paul is saying when he talks about the days are evil. But I also wonder, is Paul saying a little more? I wonder, could it be that Scripture is reminding us that our days, the the time that we have been given as a gift from God, must be taken up, must be utilized, must be embraced in order for it to be useful, in order for it to be that gift, in order for it to be made good. Otherwise, our days and hours just pass through our fingers like like water. Pass by like sand in an hourglass. The gift of our time, the gift of our days and years, 
is it really still a gift if it's left unexamined, undervalued, unredeemed? Because that's actually the word that Paul uses here in this verse. A lot of our translations will say make the most of the time or make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. But what Paul is saying here more precisely when he says these words is to redeem the time, to buy it back, to reclaim the hours that you've been given. That's what this word redemption really means. When we talk about what it means to redeem something, we're talking about purchasing back or to buy back something at a cost. And Paul says, that's what you need to do with your time. Redeem the time. Reclaim it. Save the day. Of course, we know this word redeem most of all from something even more than that. We know this from what Christ has done for you. Redemption is what Christ has done when He purchased our lives with His blood and and afforded to us an inheritance in His name. When He pulled back our lives and reclaimed them from the road that we were on in sin. When He saved us from slipping away. And now Paul says to the redeemed, to the rescued... You've got some redeeming to do as well. Your life has been given a new purpose. You're a new creation in Christ. You've been made new. What does it mean to make the most of that? What does it mean to redeem the time? Today and in the next two Sundays, we're going to be asking that very Question, and maybe this is a good time of year for you to be asking yourself this question as the calendar changes to a, a new year. Ask yourself, does my time need to be rescued? Can the hours that I've been given become something more? What does it look like for me to save the day? What does it look like to live this day? For Christ. I want to provide three answers that I think Scripture gives to this question, one of them each of these next few weeks. Our first is that if we want to make the most of the time, if we want to reclaim our days and our hours and our years to be something more, we must learn to live as those who are awake. So Paul says, wake up. Like a good preacher, he says, wake up. He says, sleeper, awake. Verse 14, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. This is the first step to being careful how you live. This is the first step to redeeming our time. If you want to save the day that you've been given, That requires us to be awake, to be alert and aware so that we can live like we want to live, so that we can live, better yet, how we ought to live in Christ. Because the simple fact of the matter is there is no sleepwalking to spiritual growth. And the simple fact of things is that we're not going to stumble along aimlessly toward spiritual growth maturity, or accomplishing God's mission, you've got to be awake. You've got to be alert. You've got to be active if you want to redeem the time. There was a student I knew in college, smart fellow, lived on my hall, who not once but twice slept through his alarm clock on the morning of his final exams. We never let him live this down, by the way, as you can imagine, I mean, talk about a nightmare scenario. I have had that dream before where I sleep through my final exam. This happened to him not once but twice. We'd see him at 825 with one shoe in his hand running full speed out the door. He's a smart student, very capable. It doesn't really matter all that much if you sleep through the exam. This passage to us is almost like an alarm clock waking us up. No matter how capable and good we may seem in our own minds, Unless we are awake and aware to these things, we may not yet be ready to redeem the time. And so Paul gives us these three things and says, keep awake, be aware 
of these things. First, he says, wake up. Be aware of who you are now, now that you are in Christ. Be aware, be awake to what God has done for you because it changes how you live. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. And that changes how you live. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good, in all that is right, in all that is true. You've been redeemed. Your life has been brought back out of the darkness and into the light. You're a a child of the light. So wake up and live like it. Wake up and rise from the dead and let Christ shine on you. The passage goes on to say, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, that is, the ways of sin, because you're not a part of that life anymore. And we've got to be awake and alert to that fact as we go about our daily lives. We're not called to live like that anymore. Maybe once we were in darkness, but no longer if you're in Christ. So part of living as someone who's spiritually awake, it means being aware of who we are now, what God has done for you, and how that changes things as we live as lights in a dark place. Paul says, be awake. The second thing he says, he says, wake up and be aware of what God desires of you. Because unless we're really aware of what God wants from us, what He desires of you, how can we live lives that are pleasing to what God wants of us, what God desires of you? And so He'll say in the passage, try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord and then do that. That's a simple thought. But it takes some alertness and it takes some effort to live our lives in that kind of way. Because how often, when we really get down to it, do the hours and minutes of our day pass by with very little thought to what pleases the Lord and and whether our actions are actually moving ourselves in that direction. We've got to know what pleases the Lord, understand it. We've got to keep this on the forefront of our minds. How else can we live lives that will please him. I'll give you an example. Growing up with a, a mom who is a teacher and also now being married to a wife who works in schools as a speech therapist, I'm sometimes amazed by some of the stories that they bring home about what kids know and what kids do not know. Uh, where food comes from is one of those things. Uh, and I'll be the first to mention to you that... I'm a a city boy through and through. There's not a country bone in my body. But when my mom asked her kindergarten kids, what kind of food do we get from a cow? And they answered, chicken nuggets. That concerns me. And I think that the Chick-fil-A mascot may be to blame on that one, the cow with the nuggets coming from the same place. But still, that really concerns me. Maybe it does you too. I'm afraid we're losing touch with nature. Uh, Alyssa was doing a project with some of the kids she works with where they were making a Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in December. And and as they were getting started, uh, she asked them what kind of animal this is. And one of them said, is that a billy goat? No. Uh, The Red-Nosed Billy Goat is not a beloved holiday tradition. And we wonder sometimes, like, if a kid's going to grow up and make healthy decisions about what they eat, and yet they have no idea what the first thing is about where their food comes from, how's that going to work? And if we expect children to grow up and live in the world, they might need to understand some really basic things about what it is and, and, and how it works. And now Paul says to us, how can you expect to live like a new creation, which is what you are? How can you expect to live like that if you're not trying to understand what it means to be that, trying to understand what it means to please God, if we don't even know His will. So Paul says, wake up and seek to know Him. 
seek to understand what he wants of us, which he helps us, by the way, and shows us to see in his word. I think what Paul is describing here in this passage is a person who is in constant pursuit, actively seeking to know God and to live accordingly. It's as simple as that, but how else can we be careful how we live? If we don't know what pleases him, how else can we live not as foolish people, but as those who understand what the will of the Lord is? If we're not seeking to know God, aren't our days and hours just going to slip by? unnoticed, unredeemed. So Paul says, wake up. Be aware of what God wants from you. And lastly, Paul says, wake up. Wake up and consider the distractions that steal away our time and cut into our thoughts and our actions. He's going to give one more example in the passage, and and I'll just say from the start that if this one example doesn't speak to you right away, don't be too quick to take yourself off of the hook here with what he says. After Paul has said, redeem the time because the days are evil, after he said, don't be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is, he goes on to say, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself, singing to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything. Now, I'm going to be preaching through Ephesians in a few weeks here in the spring, and I'll have more to say about this verse here. But for now, maybe it's enough to say, do we see the connection between do not get drunk with wine and Redeem the time, because the days are evil. What I think the passage is showing us is that this act of getting drunk is an example of something that can be used to numb our minds to the world and life we're living, or maybe be this escape from the world and life that we're called to live, the fleeting pleasure of escape. Maybe that's what is sought in that action Yet is this the sort of action that's helping us to be alert or awake to what we're called to be? Is it the sort of thing that's helping us to redeem the time that we've given? Really, it's actually doing the opposite of that. And maybe this is an example that someone might need to hear. Something that scripture challenges us to consider when it comes to our own lives. Yet even if you're sitting here today and thinking maybe that's not me... I wonder how many other things function in our lives just like this. Ways that we behave and act that make us numb to the world. That take our eyes off of the way that we ought to live. The kind of things that become for us an escape from who we're called to be rather than helping us to embrace that very Thing. The passage says, don't be consumed by those things. These things that swallow up our time and deaden us to our calling. These things that may be a fleeting pleasure for time. Instead, live in the fullness of the Spirit of God, which awakens us to the world that we live in and awakens us to how to live usefully in the world. In fact, the verse kind of places in contrast getting drunkenness with worship. Did you notice that? Almost as if they're given to us as opposites here, and worship represents what it means to be truly awake, truly alive, truly fulfilled, who we're created to be. And so in this passage, we're given these three words that say wake up. Wake up to where you've come from, what God has done for you. Wake up to what God wants of you, what he desires. Wake up and set aside those consuming behaviors that pull us away from our true purpose. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you.
Because when we live as those who are awake, it's then that we're ready to save the day, the days that we've been given, to redeem them for something more, to redeem them for Christ. Maybe this morning this is something that you need to hear, this reminder about how we spend our time and what a gift it can be if we use it well. Maybe someone here today is realizing that your time needs rescuing from the things that so consume us in our lives. Maybe you're challenged to strive for something more this new year with how you live and how you walk. I can just say this, that it does us no good to hit the snooze button on our spiritual growth and our spiritual walk. Now is the day to wake up. Now is the day to redeem the time, to seek the Lord with your life. Of course, we know this most of all is important because of what Christ has done to redeem us in his giving of his life, to redeem us by his blood. Maybe someone needs to respond to that today. The fact that we are given the opportunity to to bask in his grace and forgiveness as we surrender our lives to him, he buys us back, reclaims us through the cross. However we may be challenged by this message today, I'd call us today to consider how we spend our moments in worship to him while we stand and while we sing.